name is Ben Cherry, and I'm a faculty member here in the Temecula campus, but also at the main campus. Um, I've been at the main campus for 14 years, and what I'm going to do in a very short amount of time today is just give you a snippet of what the courses that I uh, most often teach. It's called Creativity, Innovation, and Entrepreneurship. And it's a course that I've been teaching since 2007, and it's something that I really am passionate about. And uh, so I'm going to give you, a, as it says there, a very abridged edition or version of um, a semester-long course in 10 or so minutes, 15 minutes. That is 15 at the max, is that right? Okay, good. So the context is this. I have a firm belief that creativity leads to innovation and that innovation leads to entrepreneurship. So one of the things we first start talking about in my course is how do we, come, how do we, how do we become more creative? How do we engage the idea generation part of our brain? so that it's kind of a relentless, discipline-based approach to creativity. There are a lot of students that believe, I'm not creative. I'm just not creative. And they keep telling themselves that. And what do you think happens? They're not creative, right? It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so one of the things, the first month and a half of this, the course, we spend a lot of time kind of breaking down a lot of the myths. So today, I'm just going to share with you a few things. And we're going to get started with this. Uh, we already talked about that. The, the basic formula for entrepreneurship and again, I'm trying to break down starting up businesses for students so that they don't think of it as something that only the brightest or the richest people in the world can achieve, but really anybody can start a business. So I say it's a function of three things. An initial idea, an initial idea, plus a willingness to engage in difficult work. So it's not just you have this idea and it's really great, and oh, is it, wouldn't it be awesome if I could do this? And you have this idea, and I, and I call it like an egg. Like you're just looking at this egg Oh, that's a great idea. But the egg's not going to do anything. You can crack it open, you can start frying it, or you can sit on it and let it hatch. But you have to do something with the egg. So the initial idea is like the egg. And then you have to really work hard with that idea. Do something with it. So get the first movement. Have some activity with that idea. And then finally, you need customers. Because without customers or people willing to pay for that idea, willing to pay for your product or your service, you don't have anything. So. The basic formula for entrepreneurship is an initial idea, hopefully a really good idea, followed by a lot of hard work, and then customers who are willing to pay for it. So let's talk first about this creativity piece. Who has more creativity than all of us? And imagine there's 30 or 40 students here, university students, really bright individuals, usually their senior year, junior year. Who's, who's more creative than those people? Who's more creative than us? Nobody. Not nobody. There is going to be a picture here. Well, actually, uh, yeah, I, I'm with you. OK. Nobody's more creative than you. I got it. But we were more creative at one point in our life. Those are five and six-year-old kids. And in fact, one of those five and six-year-old kids is sitting in the back. She's featured prominently here as uh, my daughter. This is my daughter, Kendall. She's also in the back. But this is when she started playing soccer. And it's not that you have to be a soccer player to be creative. But I started working on Fridays about once every three or four Fridays. I'd go into her kindergarten class and help the teacher. I was blown away by the amount of creativity that those kids have. And I compared them to the university students, which at that time I'd probably been teaching university students for about 15 years. And I was saying, we have a problem. We really have a problem. These university students aren't using their creative faculties. They're not using their mind. And so I think kids have a great deal of creativity. And so again, one of the things is to break down the notion that you're not creative, and instead just to remind yourself that at one point in your life, you were incredibly creative. There's a very good TED Talk video by Sir Ken Robinson called How Schools Kill Creativity. I definitely encourage you to watch it. It's well worth your 10 or 15 minutes of time. So kids are more creative than us, I think. And we, there's a number of reasons for that in class. We kind of break that down. But right now, just assume that I'll assume that you agree with me on that. <clears throat> and I think this is one of the reasons. If I give this question to a university classroom, and I say, find the, one, find the right answer here. What's the one that's different from all the others? After a bit of time, students begin thinking, I know the right answer. So I ask for an idea. What's the right answer? Any sense of what the right answer is there? A. a why? OK, it's complete. It's a, it's a real shape. It's a shape I've always seen, something like that. OK, anybody want to say a different answer? 
You can all come in if you'd like. No problem. What's that? I'm going to say D. D. Why? I've never seen it before. Never seen it before. New. It's different. Okay. What we, oh, yes, young man in the back. Why E? You've never seen that one before, okay? And it's the only one that doesn't have a curve associated with it. So then we get a little bit of arguing in class, like, no, my right answer is right. The reality is, much of what we teach in schools is find the right answer. And one of the other myths I try to break down is that much of life doesn't have one right answer. It has multiple right answers. And sometimes we want to just pick the best wrong answer, the best of the wrong answers that are available as our best answer. But this one right answer philosophy or thinking gets ingrained in us, and kindergarten students don't have it. So as we progress through middle school, high school, college, we get students thinking about one right answers. And so again, the first couple of weeks of class, I try to get that out of their mind, this focus on one right answer. But then I tell them, we are going to have an exam, and there are going to be some right answers on that exam. But uh, again, we're trying to break down kind of the, 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 thing, the barriers to our creativity. So Ranger, Roger Van Oak wrote a book called A Whack on the Side of the Head. It's an excellent book about creativity. It's probably now about 20, 25 years old. And he says the right answer approach becomes deeply ingrained in our thinking. The difficulty is that much of life isn't this way. And so I'm trying to encourage students to be creative. So let's keep talking about these creativity blocks. In Roger Van Oak's book, he lists 10 creativity blocks. Some of these are already mentioned, the one right answer approach, or you may have said it to yourself or to somebody else. That's, just be logical, right? It doesn't follow logic, therefore that's a creativity block. Or a statement or a thought that you just follow the rules or you follow the status quo. The fourth one that he describes is be practical, kind of this focus on it doesn't really make sense, so be logical, and it's not practical. It'll never work out. Or Let's not spend a lot of time playing because playing is pointless. And in fact, what we do a lot in the, in the first few weeks of class is play in a variety of different ways, exercise our right brain. We overly specialize in a, sp a specific uh, topic or uh, skill set instead of having a broad understanding of uh, the world and, and various different skills. We don't like ambiguity, so we avoid it at all costs. We actually stay away from ambiguity. We have this concern that we'll look foolish, or the other one that we've already mentioned, I'll make a mistake. So there's concern about failure. And then this one, I'm not creative. If you think you're not creative, you're not going to be creative. So how do we overcome some of these things? Well, first of all, in an organizational setting, we want to value creativity. We want to re regard it as a core corporate value. How do we do that? That's a different class, different time uh, for us. Uh, we get diverse thoughts by being diverse ourselves, not just diversity in the kind of traditional ways, male, female, skin color, age, all that stuff, which, is, which certainly is important diversity, but diversity of experiences, diversity of backgrounds, diversity of languages that we use in our thinking even, not necessarily languages that we speak only. If you expect creativity, you're going to get it, but you also need to realize that failure accompanies creativity, and so one of the ways to, first of all, counteract these creativity blocks is to recognize failure as part of it and to embrace the failure and learn through it. Having flat organizational structures help with getting more creativity. Being a curious person, um, we, in our family, we've talked about curiosity. And have you two heard me talk about that ever? Being curious? Yeah. So now you know I actually talk about it in class, too. Uh, both of our kids are incredibly curious. And they're a wonderful reminder to me about the value of creativity. Seeing problems as opportunities rather than just problems. Another uh, way to achieve some creativity is to capture ideas when you have them, record them in some way, and then reflect on those. Uh, Einstein, uh, uh, or sorry, Edison is famous for his notebooks that he kept. Incredible amounts of thoughts and ideas that he had that he would refer back to years later. And so capturing your ideas, harnessing them later or even at the time. Encouraging alternative approaches to, to ways of thinking uh, to approaches to solving those problems. And then we need to, in organizations, we need to reward creativity, give people a motivation for being creative, but also treat them as heroes when creativity is, is demonstrated. And then inviting lateral thinking. So we'll see if we'll get to that point here in a second. But basically, lateral thinking is instead of looking at a, at a problem with a very analytical approach, which analytics is really good, 
But sometimes those analytics lead us to a dead end, and sometimes we just give up. But instead of getting to the dead end, we actually take a step to the side and look at the problem differently. We use a different thinking language. And so lateral thinking, literally, I describe to the students, it's taking a step to the side and then taking the step to the side again. Look at the problem differently, approach it from a different angle, make sure you understand, make sure your assumptions are correct about that. So my question to all of you today is what can you do to enhance your own individual creativity? And frankly, what difference does it make if you're not more creative? And what I say to the students, I think it makes a big difference to me not only as a faculty member if I'm not more creative, because then I'd just be doing the same thing over and over and over again. It would get old for me, it would get old for the students. But I think it's important for me to be creative as a father or as a husband or as a business owner or as a name it. So I think in credit, uh, creativity is important for all of us, not just those of us who teach it or those of us who are in a classroom to, uh, to discuss it. So here's thinking laterally. One example I give to the students is how many tennis balls will fit in a 12-inch box? Now, if I give you some time to think about that, some of you are going to approach it. Well, actually, tell me how you'd approach it. 144. 144. Why? 12 by 12. OK, 12 by 12. So? It's a square box, so 12, 12 high, yes. 12 across. Yep, so the volume of a 12-inch box. Is 12, 12 tennis balls times 12 rolls. OK, all right. It was quick, quick assumptions, quick analysis. Get you in the ballpark, mm -hmm. all right? Someone else will acknowledge, well, what do you mean by a 12-inch box? Is it, is it made out of concrete? Is it made out of cardboard? Is it 12 inches in all dimensions, all directions? So the first step that we need to do is figure out what assumptions are we making and are those testable assumptions, are they correct? Another is, does the tennis ball have to stay in its shape? Is it a fully compressed tennis ball that you just opened up the canister and it goes psh and you get the tennis ball out and it's really hard, that's going to be different than the tennis ball that your dog plays with that's been out in the sun for months and months. Or the kind of a destroyer kind of kid in class will say, well, what if I like uh, took the tennis balls and like cut them up? I'm going to fit a lot more in the box. So that's looking at the problem multiple ways. And we approach those problems differently. Some of us have a more analytical approach and some of us have what, what's been called the, the, the thinking style, the entrepreneurial thinking style, is a mix of this analytical linear approach with a nonlinear approach. So an analytical linear approach, we could say Edison would be an example of that. A nonlinear Disney. Both are incredibly creative individuals, but the way they approach things is very differently. Yeah, I would say a, a tennis ball is probably two inches short. It's probably six by six. And You're still working on it. That's good. <laughs> I love it. I love it. No, that's exactly right. There's, and that, so thinking laterally is not just the, well, let's see, in, back in math, I figured out this and this and this, but it's actually challenging yourself at the front end by saying, am I making the correct assumptions here, or is there something I'm missing? Now, here's the last thing I'll say, and then we'll, we'll leave it today. There's a, this is a story. I'll, read it, uh, I'll let you read it for a moment, and then if you think you have an answer, you can share that with me. Now, usually we have more than one minute to discuss this, but this is kind of those thought questions. Do you guys get those kind of questions in school, like where it's a paragraph and you have to figure out the right answer? Sometimes it involves math. Okay. So Mel stared through the dirty, soot-smeared window on the 26th floor, depressed, opens the window, jumps through it, miraculously doesn't get injured. Anybody know what the answer to this is? There's a hint. Step to the side and look at the problem differently. Because my guess is your immediate belief is open the window, jump through it, because that's what it says. Now change that. Literally flip it, reverse it. Because it's your first assumption is the one that needs to be challenged. What is it? Yeah, the window washer and jumping into the building, not out of the building. That's exactly right. And there's some cues and clues in the story that would enable you to come to that conclusion. But there's a lot more clues and cues that are telling you this is a person who's very depressed and is trying in some way to hurt themselves. 
So when we, the first problem, of, uh, the first step in solving a problem is making sure our assumptions are correct and testing those and throwing them away temporarily to say, what if it wasn't a person inside a building but instead was outside the building? So that's it. My time's up. I wish we could talk a lot more, but creativity, innovation, entrepreneurship is the course that I teach, and uh, I'd welcome any questions. I don't know if there's a next person or anything else, but all right. Well, thanks. And yeah. Thank you all for participating. It's different for me to be recorded because in my classes I don't, I'm not like, you know, stand in one place kind of person. I like to interact with students and, and, uh, and part of my teaching is your teaching one another. So anyway, thanks for your time.